okay so so uh, good evening good afternoon and uh, good morning everyone good morning yes, uh, yes. yeah yeah because we have people joining from different different uh, locations zone countries and you know cities so so welcome to this wonderful session of agile leadership uh, practice and we have two beautiful very knowledgeable expert from this field you know who will be sharing lot of insight on this in next you know uh, close to one hour and this was the this was the program this was the session actually i was waiting for because we keep talking about agile 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 organization should be agile people should be agile but nobody talk is that hr should also be agile yeah and and uh, you know so so please pay attention to this session and uh, this is only the i would say the kind of trailer because agile hr agile hr subject or topic cannot be covered in just 60 minutes it has to be you know given more time because you know end of the day we are talking about hr which is uh, no more than the people and you know, no topic can cover about people just within uh, 60 minutes yes so we have two two beautiful uh, guests uh, and uh, if i read the profile and uh, you know in a, in a short but i would request them to uh, also cover up you know if in case i missed out any achievement of theirs but before that i like to thanks gautam and abhilasha who actually you know connected these things and uh, and said ki let's 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 make this happen and gautam saha who's the group hr head india africa share services uh, based in pune if i'm not wrong he is part of the hansa team and he has a experience of more than uh, 15 to 20 years in hr passed out in jever institute of social science thanks gautam i think this is very much needed we are talking about so many things future of work and others this is also need to be discussed let me move to the so the, the first speaker uh, who is uh, van tarken if i'm not if i'm able to pronounce properly yeah and uh, yes if anybody just you know do the google search or go through his uh, profile on the linkedin you know he has been uh, really spreading the awareness of this topic and uh, currently he is with uh, you know university of peninsula uh, as a faculty of organization dynamic or obviously uh, agile hr coach coach since uh, 2016 he was chro of sss real estate and then before that he worked with ibm as well so welcome ben and we looking forward lot of insight from you uh, another speaker okay ben is from usa i forgot to tell you uh, he is based in if i'm not wrong in uh, new jersey right, right. yes he is and by jersey. the way his she's thank you i haven't been called beautiful in about 30 years so i uh, <laughs> okay. i i very much appreciate that uh, endorsement Thank you so much. Not likely to happen anytime soon. Well, that's true. It's like yes, yes. <laughs> and and uh, here is our second speaker, very knowledgeable, okay, and uh, loving talking about HR and obviously agile HR as well. Stephen Hart, Vice President, HR Federal Reserve Bank of uh, Philadelphia. And uh, if I see his profile, he has worked with only this company. and he has a more than uh, uh, 19 year of experience so i would call it i i would say you know close to 20 year of uh, experience he has a good educational uh, background of organization dynamics so without spending much time uh, i just like to end over but before that uh, if if anybody do not know about it, hr shaper because uh, you know obviously this uh, communication mostly uh, circulated through hr shaper but uh, yes van and other team also working behind this so hr shaper is a 6 year old body having a presence in almost uh, 30 to 40 countries of uh, 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 not only india but outside overall you know we have 50 country presence in uh, worldwide uh, i am founder of hr shaper we keep doing lot of webinar with global leaders and in india uh, you know uh, leaders Uh, so this this is brought to you by uh, agile hr uh, concentram and hr shaper guys please pay attention this is very interesting topic and we look forward to hear from both of you stephen and ben over to you well thank you very much ashish and ladies and gentlemen i thank you so much for attending this presentation today and for giving us this opportunity to speak to you about our approach for implementing an hr leadership program 
I'm first going to provide a brief context for the program, and then I'm going to hand it off to Wayne to provide a little bit more details about it. But I'd like to start by telling you a brief story about how the program we'll talk about today came together. The date was December 6, 2018, and uh, I invited Wayne to be a guest speaker at my class that I teach at the University of Pennsylvania on human capital leadership. And Wayne promised to lead the students through what uh, was, turned out to be a very interactive exercise, teaching them the fundamental principles of HR methodology when it's applied in a strategic HR context. And so I was an observer, I was watching what was going on and I noticed a few things going on with my students as they engaged with this material. First of all, there was a, a real sense of energy. They were very much interacting and engaged actively in open discussion and exploring options very uh, enthusiastically. And second, they were very playful, enjoying inventing approaches and exploring solutions and being quite innovative in what they were coming up with. And finally, there was a very strong commitment to action. Because they were on the same page and shared the same vision, they were very eager to implement solutions. Now, like many of you, uh, I'm a big fan of cricket. Uh, I'm an Englishman, so I, I have uh, followed cricket all my life, but I recently watched the Netflix documentary featuring, featuring a series with the Mumbai Indians following their championship win. And as I watched the documentary, I was reminded of that evening in my class with Wayne. And I realized that implementing agile principles to solve strategic HR issues is very similar to the way the teams in the IPLC 20 tournament approach and prepare for their next tournament challenge. And some of the similarities I noticed include the following. There was this creation of a shared vision. There was a, the often of sharing responsibility for the results. There was a commitment to action and the experimentation with combinations of players' abilities in response to the environment and the competition that they faced. There was noticeable flexibility and adaptability to change when it was needed. They were for reflecting on the outcomes of each game and they made necessary adjustments before the next one. They employed the best of everyone's talents and capabilities. And as whether or not they won or they lost, they did so as a team. The leaders were working with passion and building trust and confidence in their players. They practiced open communication and they focused on an outcome that is greater than any one of the players individually. And I noticed that these are the very things that our program on Agile HR leadership aspires to do for organizations we work with. We help to drive their desire to be more effective and responsive to the needs of their organizations. However, when it turns out that what I observed and experienced in my class on December 7th is not necessarily the reality that we see within the HR community at large. The reality is that HR is often notoriously slow and sometimes reluctant to take the strategic lead in their organizations, adopting what I would call a more passive approach, focusing on the transactional functions that are so necessary, but maybe not sufficient to help HR become a strategic leader for an organization. And it's been our experience that we've encountered quite a range of engagement among HR teams we've worked with. HR leaders are often handicapped by antiquated policies, procedures, and technology. They sometimes lack the development of their leaders, and they're not focused on the needs of the whole organization. At the very worst, there is no strategic engagement at all, which also leads to an unclear understanding of the role that HR plays in the organization. And we often hear phrases such as, HR puts the no in innovation coming from both HR employees as well as other employees across the organization. In some organizations we work with, we see some better practices and more engagement at a strategic level. We see in these organizations a clear view that HR is engaged in helping the organization to meet its challenges and has some role in partnership at the C-suite level to drive critical human capital and HR initiatives and be recognized as an important function. And then in the very best of cases, we see HR leaders fully engaged, integrated and immersed in the strategic imperatives of their organization, 
and are truly recognized as a partner, not only at the C-suite level, but across the entire enterprise. However, we think that no matter where you are currently on this continuum, there are at least three things that we should expect to have to deal with as an HR leader in the months and years ahead, and particularly in the post-COVID environment. First of all, we think you can expect to see further disruption, and that's gonna be the new normal. We're gonna to continue to have this cycle of disruption. And I think we're gonna be called upon to respond to these disruptions with a greater sense of urgency. And I think we're gonna to have to work very hard to have the right impact and be ready to pivot quickly. Now, one of the best sources for understanding the current trends in human capital is the annual Deloitte Global Human Capital Trends Survey. This annual survey includes responses from almost 9,000 HR leaders across the entire world. This year's report is titled, The Social Enterprise at Work, Paradox as a Path Forward, presents some surprising statistics as described in a section titled, A Memo to HR. So just look at the following statement from that report. Despite the progress made, global respondents to the survey reported a 64 point gap between importance and readiness, with 75% saying the evolving role of HR was important or very important for their success over the next 12 to 18 months, but only 11% saying they were ready to address this trend. That find us leads us to ask a fundamental question. Given the growing importance of the human element at work and the continued gap in HR readiness, Will HR remain as a distinct function, or has 10 years of progress been overshadowed by a persistent view that HR may never get there, signaling the end of HR as we know it? Now, there's no doubt that change is coming, but we believe it needs to be more than transformation or reinvention or even revolution. It needs to be foundational, and that's where this story begins. We think that the kind of movement HR needs in the challenging landscape of work will require HR to address some key challenges. And the Deloitte study identifies two significant barriers. The way in which HR is typically structured and HR's general lack of alignment with the areas where the biggest impact can be made. So the report identifies the biggest challenge, the changes that HR should make to maximize its impact. And they include the following. Firstly, increase new capabilities by adopting a new mindset, embracing new traits and behaviors that can help allow an enterprise to thrive in the digital age. Second, change the HR organization design to incorporate more agile and team-based work by applying a new lens, adopting an operating model that enables HR to flex based on dynamic business needs. Thirdly, Increase the efficiency through which HR activities often occur through automation. They can do this by adopting enablers, deploying advanced technology to promote productivity and value and simplify the experience. And fourth, expand the expectations and stature of HR leaders by elevating their focus, driving tangible, measurable value across the enterprise. By expanding its scope of influence and area of focus to effectively manage the human elements of work, HR leaders drive the move away from the traditional HR model to create what the report says is exponential HR, the place where it is perceived to have the greatest impact on the organization and is a true, true strategic partner in the enterprise. Our agile HR leadership model is focused on helping HR leaders reach that exponential space for their organization. We start by where you are and we help to move you to where you need to be. I'll now hand over to Wayne who'll talk a bit more specifically about the program in detail. Thank you, Steve. So the goal of the ne next half of the webinar is basically to look at this exponential HR and expand it. How can you do that? Steve has made a great case for the research and the need to do this and what we're going to talk about now is how how can you use some of the things we found to help you get there so you know i've always been uh 
curious. Even a little boy, I was always playing with toys and trying to figure things out. It was always, I was never one to kind of avoid a uh, struggle and trying to make sense of things. And it drives me crazy all the time, but that's, that's who I am. It's in my DNA. And so being in HR for many years, I was always frustrated by the lack of success of enterprise projects, whether it was a new compensation plan or employee engagement or applicant tracking system. They rarely, rarely worked out, despite a lot of effort, a lot of time and, and a lot of commitments and people worked hard. And I'm sure you've experienced it yourself. You worked on different projects that you thought started out with a lot of energy and, 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 and you thought you were building something that was really going to work. And it turns out it didn't work out. Either it wasn't finished, ran out of money, new leader came in and wiped it out. And so, you know, we've seen this all along. And so my goal, my passion has been, how do you fix this? And, and so um, I took a slight diversion in my career. Uh, I, uh, believe it or not, I actually became a scrum master developing enterprise software at IBM and Comcast. It's a new role for me, you know, being in HR for 15 years. And I struck a little bit, but it was, you know, it was, uh, it was a challenge and I enjoyed it. And so IBM at the time in our division, we were just starting the agile journey. We had uh, just, you know, created the agile teams. I was working with teams in, in the United States, team in Vizag, India. If anybody's in the call from Vizag, but um, it'd, be, it'd be nice if you were. Um, and, and really, you know, I, I started to see that Agile had done does, does one thing I hadn't seen before. It actually worked. It actually took a large amorphous project and broke it down into small pieces that people could incrementally fix and do. And I said, wow, this is great. Um, can we do this in HR? And, you know, it's been my struggle for the last five years is really to figure out how can we take some of the agile practices that we use in HR, in IT and apply to HR, because it's not, it's not IT, this is our agile version. It's kind of a blend of some of the key practices we learned, some of the themes. And so I looked at the agile practices that we had done at, at IBM and Comcast, and I, you know, I came up with seven key themes, key ways of working that I thought really made sense. And I said about, you know, how can we present this to people? You know, I started out using my scrum master knowledge of uh, um, stack ranking and story pointing and things like that. And people would kind of roll their eyes and they doze off because they didn't understand what that meant. And I realized that um, you can't have IT, you can't have agile for IT. You have to have it for business people who don't, you know, haven't lived in the IT world and have a different frame of reference around things. So, you know, with these seven things, how, how can we get people to understand it? Because uh, it's always about context, right? You're given new things, and how do you how do you create a context that makes sense for you? So, Steve can tell you I had a lot of uh, acronyms that were crazy. You know, different. Some had multiple letters. I tried to make them sound good, and it didn't work out. So one day I was just listening to the uh, to the TV, watching the TV, and and a uh, Gina Rometty, who was the CEO at IBM, was talking about EBITDA and you know earnings before income taxes, depreciation, amortization. The light bulb went off. I figured, oh, wow, this is it. I'm going to tie in my seven practices with the EBITDA theme. Now, of course, I added extra T, but, but basically I thought, you know, if we can use EBITDA to measure the financial health of the organization, why can't we use EBITDA, my version, to show the agile health of, the of HR and the organization? And so um, that's what we did. And so the rest of the presentation, we're going to talk about how you – your own situation, regardless of where you are, can apply some of these principles. So that's basically the foundation. Okay, let's go. I'm going to go through EBITDA a little, little more detail. You know, the first two are probably the most important. Experimentation, not perfection, is the focus. You know, you, you, Mike, like me, you've worked in many organizations where we want to get it right. We have to, you know, have to do everything perfectly. We can't make any mistakes and if that was even possible, right? Um, and Agile says, you know, we don't get, you don't let perfection get in the way of trying. And so creating an experimentation mindset and culture is critical. And then the second thing in Agile is we break down big problems, projects, and small components. Everything we do in Agile, meetings, planning, documentation, is all breaking down a large efforts and making smaller pieces so that you can incrementally, iteratively make improvements. You know, you, you just can't build one thing all the time. You have to work a piece by piece by piece until it scales. And that's the idea in Agile. Agile looks at time differently. 
instead of you know waterfall projects go for six months, it basically divides work into two to three or four week time increments called sprints, where we do a piece of that in a period of time and another piece in another period of time, and you know we slowly incrementally improve. It requires certain kinds of teams. Agile teams are different. They're typically smaller, six to eight people. It's not based on individuals, but roles. You have someone who represents the voice of the customer. You have someone who rep is kind of the project leader, could be called a scrum master, could be called a project leader. And you have other roles uh, aligned with what the stakeholders and what the requirements are. Second, D is developing servant leaders. You know, servant leaders um, basically facilitate. They don't really tell people what to do. They encourage and guide and they step back and let the teams do their work. And the last thing um, is always be communicating with customers. This is the number one problem I think in HR is we, we don't really have ongoing conversations with our customers, our clients. We do things because we think they're good and they, they, the customer's gonna want them, but then we do it, the customer surprise. Well, I didn't really want this. And so Agile has a way of daily interactions with customers that validate what you're doing so you don't have any scope creep or challenges. So, you know, as Steve and I, Steve talked about um, visiting his class and uh, it was a great time. And uh, we, you know, we thought, well, why don't we make this a course? You know, it's unusual, you know, right? you know, one's really, I didn't really see an agile HR leadership course at a university level, let alone a graduate course. And so we approached the, uh, uh, the, the University of Pennsylvania organizational dynamics program and, and asked, you know, what about this idea? And, and to their credit, they were receptive. They'd heard about Agile too. They had heard about Agile and IT, but, but how can we apply it to other areas besides IT? And so Steve and I went about developing this course. And as we got into it, we realized, you know, Agile, you know, is a series of practices, but it needs an element of leadership to be successful. It's not going to work unless you have strong leadership capabilities. And, you know, an Agile leader is different than the typical leader. We talked about, you know, servant leadership. That's a piece of it, but it's more about providing guidance and, and, and organizing things in a different way. And so Steve, uh, he's, he's great at this finding resources. He went out and did some research and found a great book called Strategic Doing. And Strategic Doing has 10 elements that really focused on setting the right environment and culture. And, and I'll just go through these quickly. Um, basically maintain a safe space. You've got to have people have to feel comfortable, you know, um, where they are uh, to be able to, to talk about things that they, you know, you need them to talk about. We ha ask the right questions. Too often people ask questions. They want, they want to validate their answers. And an agile leader, you can't really do that. You have to figure out what you're missing. And by asking framing questions like, how might I, things like that, you solicit a unbiased um, conversation from your people, you get new ideas. Um, you have to you take your assets, your people in this case, or resources, and you have to combine them in a way that makes the most sense. It's how you put a team together, not with uh, people based on their title, but pe people based on their talents and capabilities. We talked about hidden assets. So, you know, Steve will talk about a little more, but, but most people, do we really only see 30% of people's true assets? There's a lot of hidden assets that people have that we don't really uncover. And so part of our journey has been to uncover those hidden assets that people can bring into the table that adds to your capabilities. The big easy. So it's not the movie. It's basically a, a two by two matrix that something that has a big impact and easy to implement. That's why I call it the big easy. So if you're, you're faced with the choice of what to work on, especially if you're starting, we recommend focusing on something that's easier to implement, but has a big impact. Um, again, Number six relates to out, you know, ideas to outcomes, measurable. We're very big on that in Agile. It's typically challenge in HR is quantifying things, but um, through this methodology, it becomes less of a problem. Uh, and people will be able to kind of quantify things, which helps when you want to uh, get approval or sponsorship from senior leaders and, and show people what you're doing. Number seven, start slowly to go fast, but start too many times. I'm sure everybody in this call has had an experience where people talked about doing something and then they had to get it perfect and all these nuances came up and something, you know, it never happened. And, and so agile is just get started, learn from your mistakes and fix it. And in this recent world with the pandemic, everybody was kind of practicing that, you know, we moved everybody from their office to their homes almost overnight. 
we didn't get it perfect. We made mistakes, but we came back and we fixed it. And that's really what Agile is about. And that's what I hope is that the things we've learned, and that's why we talk to clients, because they're, they're frustrated. They want to incorporate this ongoing, not just post-COVID, but as part of their normal way of doing things. Short-term action plans, Agile is typically, you know, 30-day uh, uh, blocks of time where we mentioned meetings to review stuff. It's not long, six-month-a-year kind of uh, project time. It's sprints and built upon into milestones and deadlines and things like that. The last thing is nudging and connecting and promoting. You know, you have to nudge people. I guess nudging is a big term nowadays in, in a subtle way, maybe not so subtle, depending on their response of this. But, you know, you really want to be able to um, – um, get people focused. So uh, it's not that we have bad math. We know seven and 10 is normally 17, but what we're trying to promote here is that it's, we're combining both systems into one focus that we're going to provide, we have been providing to organizations. So, okay. So we talked about the auction and, you know, I'm, I'm not a cricketer. I'm, I, uh, I've been fascinated by the game. I've been hearing a lot about it. So if nothing else, through this process, I've learned more about it. And Steve's been helpful to that. And so we, this great movie on that Netflix around this. And as soon as we saw it, I said, wow, this is Agile 101. I mean, they, they were practicing a lot of principles we're talking about. You know, in the upper left there, they had the auction. And then on the lower right, they have the team. And so that, if I look at the lower right, that could be some, some representative of an Agile team, right, that they put together for this, for this process. And so... Um, but then we said, you know, a lot of the people on the call today are not, don't, aren't managing at cricket teams. They don't evolve, but they have their own organization. Some are doing well, some are not doing well. So how do we make a program that works for everybody? And we decided we need a modular approach. We wanted to take the seven EBITDA principles and the 10 strategic doing principles, plus some other modules focused on change management, adoption, executive buy-in, which are other areas we thought were really important. And so we, we came up with over 30 components and not to overwhelm you, but that, that ability is enables us to really customize and tailor. And so how do we start that process? Well, we have something called the agile HR readiness survey, which I'll mention at the end, it basically gives a starting point. We know where people are. Are you at the very beginning of the agile um, continuum? Are you at the middle of the end? And so based upon that, we tailor the different modules to fit companies where they are. So it doesn't really matter if you're a small company or a large company. It doesn't matter if you're doing well or not doing well. It really helps kind of um, make this work. But then we thought, you know, are there any common elements? So, we're, you know, we're talking to people, um, 130 at this point, you know, they're all from different backgrounds and different places. Are there any common elements that we could um, create, you know, like comparing apples and oranges? Um, that would make sense so that we could have some core basic principles. So we thought about this, you know, Steve and I like to brainstorm. We were on a call till what, 10 o'clock last night, brainstorming. I mean, it's just part of our DNA. We, we, that's who we are. And so, you know, we thought of all these 30 plus modules, are there any that are, you know, really consistent that we could apply across organizations kind of as a starting point, as a foundational. And so we came up with, with six, let me kind of, but let's kind of talk about them to reveal them to you. Right. So these are the what, what Wayne and I determined were the six agile leadership cycle principles or elements that no matter what size of uh, engagement we're included in, uh, these, ten, these six tend to be present. And two of them, experimentation and inclusivity, the ones in green on your screen, they are very much sort of embedded in the culture of an organization, whereas the other four are a little bit more tactical in the way that they're done. So let's just quickly go around them to understand what we mean when we talk about experimentation. The, the real value of experimentation is the opportunity to provide a failing fast uh, dynamic so that uh, something that you're trying out, you get to know very early on whether or not it's gonna be scalable and whether or not it's meeting the objectives of your uh, project that you're working on. And I think that's really important to build energy and to get quick uh, responsiveness from the environment as to whether you're on the right track. But the other advantage of this from a leadership perspective is that experimentation requires leaders who are open 
to their environment. They're also, it provides a playfulness and is highly motivating for the people who are involved in an experimenting culture of an organization. The second part is inclusivity. It's really critical that we have the right people in the room, and, but it's also an opportunity for people who may not potentially be involved in strategic initiatives in an organization to get involved. So the right leader would be the kind of person who looks for bringing an inclusive team together. And the value of doing so helps people to create a, a deep sense of belonging in their organization, which in turn increases their motivation and their ability to want to be engaged in what's going on. Revealing hidden assets is kind of the first tactical element in here. And we, uh, we, we really advocate the use of uh, understanding what it is that people do below the surface line. And for this, we use an iceberg analogy. Imagine an iceberg sitting in the ocean. You see only a small amount of the total size of that iceberg sitting on the surface. And so it is with people's skills. Very often in the workplace, we are bringing only a fraction of our interests, our capabilities, and our experience into our workload. But by deliberately asking people, what other things do you have an interest in? What other oh. things drive you? What other things make you really feel accomplished in your life and work? And finding a way to integrate the best of that into the experience is a great way to do it. And we find this really has tremendous power in improving engagement in an organization when people get to use a wider range of skills in the execution of a strategic initiative that is not simply related only to their job responsibilities. So let's focus on breaking things down, which you mentioned before in EBITDA. It, the focus really is on incremental changes. And, you know, you have a, a project with a thousand pieces and it can be overwhelming. But if you break it down into 10 and then 10 and then 10, it, it's a lot easier to get your handle on. You can focus on or 10% done, or 20% done, and, and that provides a level of clarity and understanding. The challenge in many projects is people are just frustrated. They don't see progress, whereas as doing it this way, you have some milestones that you achieve, and people can, can appreciate successes. They're recognized for what they've done every couple of weeks versus every couple of months, if ever. Framing questions um, provides a context. People need to know where they're going. They have to be able to align their actions towards that. By asking these kind of clarifying questions, you're promoting where you want to go and, and, and bringing people along with you. Deciding what next. So agile HR leadership is not a one and done deal. It's not going to work that way. It's going to be, if you did it that way, it'd be like every other software, uh, every other program that's sitting on your bookshelf gathering dust. Um, it's a, it's a way of working. And, and so there's no end. Um, once you've, put agile teams together. They're continually looking at what problems to fix. You're never going to run out of problems to fix. It's really um, critical that uh, it's, it's viewed as a continual process. So the key challenge now is, you know, the, 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 the cycle is great. These components are great, but, but how do you, you know, what do you do with it? Right. I mean, it's nice to hear about it, but you know, what's the practical outcome in your organization? Um, you know, because the goal here is to really improve productivity, uh, increase accountability, and uh, do things faster, and promote understanding and taking meaningful action. And the problem is most people, when they, they try something new, is they go to a webinar just like this one, and they come back excited, just like I know you're all going to be. And they, you know, they talk to their leadership, and they say, you know, let's try this put a focus, focus group together, you know, a little team and work on it. And then they go out and they run into a brick wall. They're not successful. And I've seen this time and time again. I'm sure many people on the call have been the same way. They've started something. They're excited. It's new. It's the greatest thing out there. And they wind up not being successful. And the, the challenge is it's, it's, not, it's not part of the way they work. Um, the only way you can't, you can't learn agile by reading a book. You have to do it. You have to try it. We talk about experimentation. You can't, you're never going to get agile, right? You just got to get started and learn from your mistakes. And, and so we said, all right, so how can we develop a way to incorporate and inculcate these components into the daily work? So if people start doing this on a daily basis, they're more likely to keep doing it. Right. And so we thought for a while, you know, how, what, what kind of work activities do people do on a regular basis 
that we could <clears throat> apply some of the agile principles in EBITDA and strategic doing into their work so that they would do agile by definition, by default. And, and that's what we thought have what's been the best result. So let me go through them quickly. Leaders, there's six. How we meet, we take, we, we shrink the meetings to 15 minutes. We do them more frequently. Uh, we wind up with problem solving. People are more engaged. Um, we find out what's going on. We find out what the problems are. It's just a better way of meeting versus the meetings that go on forever and nothing gets done. <clears throat> We communicate more effectively. Uh, we don't focus on documentation, paper. We focus on communications. Every day, as part of the Scrum Sprint Team meeting, the product owner who represents the business and the team are communicating. It reduces the chance for scope creep and, and challenges so that when you're done, people are on alignment. So we focus on how we plan. You know, typically we would go these long-term plans, six months, a year, whatever. I mean, imagine if you had done a plan on March 1st of this year, by March 15th, it would have been obsolete. So Agile shrinks the planning down to smaller bits where you focus on delivering minimal viable products on a regular basis, and you come up with lease dates, and it's a much more slower, shorter incremental process. How we leverage time? Again, we talked about sprints, two to three, maybe four week time periods where we commit to doing, a, we break down all the work, into smaller discrete elements. And we do that work during the sprint, two to three weeks. And we celebrate successes. People are engaged. People see the results. They're motivated and they see where they're going. How we assign work. Again, many of you who are interested in Agile, it's not your full-time job, right? You you're have regular work to do in your organizations. And now we're gonna ask you to do a little more for Agile. Now, ideally in the IT world, you have dedicated developers. That's all they do is Agile in an organization in HR, if you could do that, that'd be great, but it's not likely. And so it's really important to break down work into components that we can assign. So that if you have 30 hours of, of regular work, we can accurately uh, schedule 10 hours of agile work. And how we organize teams. Again, um, typically teams are based on, you're the boss, here's my team, leader subordinate, or we bring everybody together because we have an idea around things, but, but you know, we don't organize teams that way in Agile. They're more focused on people who can contribute to solving the problem and executing, doing the work. So that again, every two to three weeks, the team does something, it accomplishes something, which is real critical. So, you know, as Steve talked about earlier, you know, there are companies that are doing not so well and some better and best. And so how do you, how do you make this work? And we, we took the 30 plus modules we looked at the cycle of six uh, key components, and then we focused on, of those components, what daily work practices could we do to make them work? And we came up with kind of a continuum. And so you are here in the first on the left, module one, curtain raiser, informational session, just to give an awareness. We really haven't had time to go in depth any of these. Any one of those six components could take hours to focus on but I wanted to give you a little bit of a, uh, a sampling of them. Um, the next one will be foundational. And we have something tentatively scheduled on September 24th. Uh, I'll put that in the chat room later. Um, it, it expands upon the, um, the uh, cycle, the six uh, components of the cycle. Um, and then for those, again, depends on where you are. If your organization is early on, maybe that makes sense for you. If you're more advanced in terms of agile thinking, there's an advanced option which typically is eight modules. We take the six, add two others to really come up with a comprehensive program. And then for other organizations, like we're doing one next week where we focused on, you know, four to six weeks of um, rigorous, maybe two hour virtual sessions with uh, two hours of in between work to get done. Uh, again, incorporating the ways of working so that um, the, the process and the improvements are sustained. Again, we decided to be flexible based upon um, you know, where you are and where you want to go. Okay. So we think about, uh, our clients often ask us, what are some considerations coming out from a process like this? What are some things that we should be beginning to put or think in, but think about and put into our mind as we uh, debate whether this is something good for us? So we give them this advice. We say there's three things you should do. Three 
key considerations about the thinking, the planning, and the doing. So if, you, if this is something that's interesting to you, you might begin thinking about uh, how do you use the uh, cultural impetus and embed the EBITDA principles into your organization. So take a look at them and how might they apply in your place. And then think about something that you might want to improve from an HR perspective in your organization. Do some early conversations and research around that. And then apply some thoughts about planning. What are the hidden assets of the people that are on the team? Start to get that early and find out uh, what other things people are interested in doing. Use the aspect of framing questions that uh, Wayne talked about earlier to surface the options because it's really not about confirming your own suspicions. It's really about opening up the environment for people to be engaged in productive conversations around what initiatives would be best to focus on for your organization to have the greatest strategic impact. And once you've identified what they are, how might they break down into smaller deliverables that people can do? So a, a project that may seem overwhelming and large in consideration, if you start to break it down, it suddenly begins to look a little bit more manageable and your capabilities to accomplish it are much greaterly enhanced. And finally, the doing. What might be some deliverables every two to three weeks around that project that you're thinking about? Uh, how might you convert uh, longer meetings into shorter ones? So taking a look at the dynamics currently in your organization, uh, are you invested in longer unproductive meetings or do you think you could convert to this idea of shorter meetings but with more meaningful outcomes? And then most importantly, be ready to experiment because we have found that experimentation is really the heart of the agile HR methodology. And if you don't have that focus and that cultural leadership around uh, allowing experimentation, what we call playing in organizational white space, where you're free to uh, imagine new possibilities, then you're doomed to some uh, concerns at the beginning. So it's about getting that experimentation culture embedded in your, your organization and getting people comfortable with the ability to play in that space. Cool. Uh, as, and as appreciation for your participation today, we, we like to offer a free tool our Agile uh, readiness tool to help you identify where you are. Um, anybody who submits it, we're going to give you a trophy. No, just kidding. Um, that's the trophy for the, uh, the T20 tournament, um, which should be, you know, your, your goal is to maybe not win the tournament, but to get in your own organization, your own way to achieve the champions, achieve your own championship. So again, if you, you know, you see Steve uh, and my um, uh, email address in the, uh, in the bottom there, just feel free to reach out. Just be glad to send it to you. Um, before we move on to the questions, we're gonna ask a poll at the end. So stick with us. Um, just wanted to get your feedback on something. And uh, you know, the key is uh, um, how can we help? So what, you know, let me uh, turn it to you know, what kind of questions do you guys have? It's, we love to uh, play stump the presenters. We don't know all the answers. Um, Agile is an evolving practice. We're not perfect. We don't claim we are. But I think by working together, we'll all figure it out. So I'm curious, what kind of questions you guys have? Just put it in the chat room. Ashish, any comments from your perspective? Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Van and Stefan. I think, uh, you know, people are getting used to it. This is new concept. That's one thing I would say. And uh, uh, what I understood, you know, from my experience and the reading on the net and all, uh, this is uh, more towards, you know, human centric approach and the policy, which is more user friendly and dedicated to each and every employee rather than standardization of the policy, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, that's what I understand about this. Yeah. Uh, I request people to, uh, you know, post the question. Uh, uh, you can see there are the question posted in Q&A section. Yeah. Uh, request everybody to put question only in Q&A section. So we should not uh, lost it. I mean, we should not lose any any question in chat box. Yep. So there are question coming uh, when uh, and uh, Stephen. So first question is very common, which I will skip right now. But there is a very common question: How to scale agile? So so let's put it like this: How to scale agile HR? Or how to convert well, HR into agile HR? Slowly and incrementally. You know. Um, the biggest problem many companies have is they, they, they go full bore. They, they bring in consultants, they have, they send everybody to training and then they expect everybody the next day to start doing it. It's never going to work. 
Um, that's why you have to start incrementally. You get a team, a team of people who are interested in the process, who are engaged and excited about that. You build the team, you learn, you screw up, you fail, you fix it, you build the team, you build another team based upon you take some people from that team who are successful, you seed another team, that team's successful, and you seed another team, and so you, you know, incrementally, exponentially grow. That's, that's the only way to do it. Um, you just have to, and again, as you're doing that, you're making mistakes, you're learning. And so each time you put a new team together, you've improved the process. Okay, thanks, Ben, for taking up this. Uh, another one is coming. Can you share an example of agile application on, a, say, developing a compensation process? I believe COMP. It's short form, so I'm, I'm, I think it's compensation process. Probably Anything? Compensation process. Any input on this question? Um, I'll take this one. Uh, you know. I, it's like any process, uh, again, it's incremental. So if you're gonna put a comp, comp program together, I would start by developing an agile team with uh, the key representatives. You wanna obviously the compensation analysts would be on the team, the director of comp, total rewards, key stakeholders. And the first thing is to really figure out the program elements. You might need legal risk um, management, you know, cause financial impact there. and and you get all the people on the team and you run through a series of sprints where you come up with the parameters. And then the implementation process could be a paper process. It could be a system process. If you have SAP or a work day, you know, that's a little more elaborate uh, in an organization. So again, I, we believe that almost anything you do can be, um, you know, you can use agile methods to kind of uh, make that work. So uh, when, uh, if, if I'm not wrong, that can be company process also, but your question cover both the things. So, so yeah, because it is written CEO, MP only. So I believe it may be company as well, but your answer also covering, you know, all the okay. company process as well. Thank you so much. The other question coming from Deepesh, by implementing uh, Agile, we will have to follow a basic principle, which will take some time, may not be cost efficient at an initial stage in that case, it may not seem a business sense to start Agile in the organization. So how do we convince business leader to adopt uh, Agile practices? Steve, you want to take that one? I think you're... Yeah, kind of I, I think space. that's uh, very much sort of a sort of a leadership issue, right? So uh, yes, you're right that uh, Agile methodology and the application of this model requires some commitment at the top of the organization to uh, engage in the process and and to agree to embed in the culture the principles that are needed here. So you were right that there are some initial stages that need to be uh, settled out before you perhaps engage in just jumping into applying this methodology. So we would certainly advocate that there needs to be a period of preparation and discussion and engagement at the senior levels in an organization to help people understand what the benefits might be. And it starts with that notion of uh, what do we want to accomplish and what is the strategy of the organization and how do people how does the people concerns in this organization really matter to uh, managing our risk and being able to achieve our objectives? So there may need to be some preparation in the very beginning to in order to uh, what we call get, get opt-in rather than buy-in. We like opt-in as a better method of thinking about it because that says that there's an agreement as opposed to sort of set, buying into somebody else's idea. By opting in, senior leaders in the organization have a sense of being able to see the benefit that this can achieve, not only for the organization itself, but also for the people that are within it. And by solving our own problems in our organization, we maybe are able to uh, move faster and be able to achieve results in a greater rate than we might have done if we had brought somebody in from the outside to accomplish this for us. So you are right that it takes some um, uh, effort and energy to build the business case for this. But once you have it and you start to see it, the results start to flow in pretty quickly. Uh, uh, I, I know it takes time to convince leadership. Any any company name you like to take up, Stephen, and when, which has implemented Agile HR and it is successful model? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think uh, ING is is probably the, the, the best example. They're a uh, financial company based in the Netherlands. They took a conservative traditional bank and made it into more of a high-tech organization. 
Uh, they had a commitment from the CEO they were going to change. And, and you know, it's, it's always industry specific. If you're an industry that's going through a lot of disruption, you're more likely to want to do something different. And Agile was a great vehicle for them versus another organization where your profits are so high and you're not as incentivized. So uh, it's usually industry evolution specific, but it's also the leadership. If a CEO says, you know, he or she, we're going to change this organization, it's going to happen. So it really depends on, on that as kind of the motivator. Thank you. Uh, there are a lot of questions. And then one yes. question I, I, I like you to answer when, and this is directed to you. What is the difference between agile and agility? Is it just so, from the English part or something else? Well, you know, um, Agility is, is more of a, and uh, I guess you get worse with here. I mean, to me, they're similar. I won't get caught up in the difference. You know, you want a more ag agile, which to me is more responsive, more, uh, uh, more uh, engaged with your customer experimentation. Whereas, you know, agility is, is the ability to, to be agile. I guess, Steve, you may have a better, you're better at these definitions yeah, than I am, sir. Yeah, I think, I think that's right. They're often used in, uh, in, in conjunction with each other. So it's, it's, it's an excellent question. And I think, it's right. So I think about um, uh, uh, the, the agile as the, the mindset of agile is means that you're you're responsive, you're ready, you're coiled for action, and you've got a sense of urgency about what you're doing, and you're able to move very quickly to respond to the environment that's around you. And I think both agile and agility serve the same purpose in that respect. So they are often used interchangeably. There's uh, the nuances between them are uh, interesting, but I don't think it necessarily. Uh, precludes uh, using one over the other in this in this instance. They both, in my mind, they both mean the same thing: the ability to be responsive and move quickly, and be able to pivot and and be responsive to the environment in which you're operating. Just want to add some. Joe jo, uh, jo Yida asked, "Does agile mean not being firm?" No, I mean uh, firm. Agile is, is being assertive. I guess is the best way to it's, you know have a methodology and a way of working that adds a lot of individual variances. So variation, I should say. And so, you know, it's a rigor. Uh, one of the challenges in any change is, is accountability, right? You know, if you implement Agile, any program, Six Sigma, design thinking, if you don't have accountability, it's never going to work. But um, it means being Agile uh, around committing to the plan, providing people the resources, but holding people ultimately accountable for actually doing the work. Oh, in, a, in a simple word, uh, when being be responsible, you know, for anything and everything which you hold, right? Yep. Yeah. Okay, great. I'm putting two questions. Uh, I'm putting, you know, at least three to four questions in a in a two kind of question. So one okay. is, uh, is it uh, this model can be successful any any industry or it is okay to be in all industries can be work. That's one. Secondly. Uh, is it again can be successful only in one part of HR or it is okay like recruitment, training, then engagement. Also, I can touch upon the culture and change also, uh, change management and culture. Can be implemented in all the sector or it has to be only in one area, one industry like this? Okay. Steve, you want to take the first part and I'll take the second? Yeah, so it, it's very interesting. That's a good question because uh, the both Wayne and I, uh, our passion comes from HR since that's where we spent most of the of our career working. But what was interesting when we taught our class in the spring of this year, we only had a few people in our class who were actually HR practitioners. Other people came from other areas of an organization, finance, uh, accounting, marketing. They were in different uh, disciplines, if you will, within, this, within a business area. So that's always one of the aspects of teaching in our course is that we never really know who's going to show up until the actual class opens up. So, but what we found was that uh, through the discussion and the learning of the principles that people saw clear applicability across different disciplines in the organization. So the person that was there from a marketing perspective also saw the possibilities of using the same principles to solve marketing questions. The person from the accounting area saw the same principles being used to solve vexing questions within accounting. And people who came from a more... Um, operations background, they also saw the same idea. And we also saw this work across nonprofit organizations too, which are very big in the United States. And they also saw that uh, there was wide applicability of these principles. So while Wayne and I are 
very much focused on helping HR to reach the pinnacle of success with these things, we do feel that the principles are equally valid in other business disciplines across an organization. I think the second part of that is, uh, I think it could apply to any part of HR. A lot of companies typically start in the talent acquisition space. Uh, companies like uh, GE and IBM have done a lot of stuff in terms of agile talent acquisition, um, where they looked at the whole resume uh, applicant uh, requisition process and applied some prioritization and agile techniques to that. And that's, that's an obvious one to get started. But really, again, uh, if you look at a big thing, break it in small pieces and incrementally improve it, it can apply to almost any function in, in, in any part of HR in an organization. I will take last two questions considering the time. In case both of you have a time, we can continue. Otherwise, we'll just close on in next five minutes. Uh, is it proactive uh, step or reactive step when we say agile HR? Say it again. I'm sorry. That is it. Is it kind of proactive or reactive? Uh, uh, you know. Uh, so let me read the. Pro okay. Is agile a proactive or reactive approach to manage a change? Well, I think it can be both. Um, you know, if if you look at a, a company that has a major problem that occurs, then typically people will get nervous and, and panic and, and then struggle for ways to do things. Um, and then agile as a methodology. I think someone asked the question, you know, can you do agile in HR during a pandemic? For, frankly, it's the perfect time. You know, you've already just, as I said before, you've, you've had a massive experimentation where you moved everybody from the workplace to remote in weeks and without thinking, you know, without getting it perfect. Once they moved there, you kind of tweaked it a little bit, you made it better, which is again, what Agile is all about. So um, it's rare that a company will be proactive. Typically, you know, when companies doing well, they're more inclined to do the status quo. But when there's a major problem, that's when we, we see more of an impetus uh, for Agile. You know, it, it evolved in the IT world because, you know, the IT track record was poor and weren't delivering things on time, over budget, out of scope. And so that was an impetus, impetus for Agile. Um, we like to say it's, it's, it's proactive. In some organization it is, but, but usually um, it's because of some issue that, or some challenge or industry evolution that a company needs to you know, get ready for or respond to. Thank you, Ben. Uh, I will take last question. Uh, so this question is very, uh, you know, very, very, uh, uh, I would say sensitive because in today's world, we talk about the human touch. Like we are, we are doing everything virtually, but how much is human touch? It's only the digital touch, you know, and, and, in, and most of the company going for a digitalization. So how much agile HR really can contribute in this? One is, you know, having a more digitalized approach in the organization, but at the same time, human touch can also be failed, though it cannot be direct human touch, but some or other way. So if I understand it correctly, um, you know, agile, we don't want to get caught up in the technology piece. Um, yes, Agile could be facilitated by technology. You certainly you have certain uh, like Jira and Rally are tools that developers use to kind of build code and it kind of takes care of the Agile process. But this is a human, this is a human system. It, it, um, it works around people and their motivations and engagement and motivation. If you don't have an engaged workforce, it's never going to work. If people mm -hmm. are motivated for this, they're not going to change. And so... Um, Technology is really an enabler as it is in most of the things we do, but it, it, this is really a humanistic approach. And we found that it, 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 it gets better motivation. People are excited. You know, it's so frustrating when you work in a project that you don't see the end of. It goes on forever um, and it never goes anywhere. And you have meetings, you know, every staff meeting every week and you talk about the same things all the time. And the only thing that changes is the due dates or the deliverables that get extended. And so that's frustrating. So agile really is, a, it's a human centered approach uh, that really focuses on the individual and engaging them, putting them in a team and letting their power exponentially increase. And so I wouldn't focus on the technology per se. Yes, it can enable it. Obviously you need Excel maybe to 
keep track of things, but it's, it's really a people centered system uh, that drives the change. Steve, anything you would add to that? Yeah, I'd just like to add, because I, I did see a question flash up in here on somebody said, can it be used as an engagement tool? And I certainly think that's true. That's been my experience with it is that the focus on the human dynamics in the workplace and the opportunity to contribute to problem solving in your workplace by using the best of your skills along with things you have a desire to do can be highly motivating and engaging for people. And you can build a, a community of uh, employees in your organization who through this process feel like they are contributing something much bigger to the organization than just the, what they bring every day in their job. So I do believe very much in the power and what Wayne said about this being a human system. That's really what makes it an appeal in an organization. And I think that's really important. And, and I noticed somebody has asked the, the book that we talked about. Um, I just like to reiterate, the book is called Strategic Doing. It's available on uh, Amazon and it's, it comes out of Purdue University and research that they did. And that was the source again for the leadership principles which we have embedded in this program. I add that to the chat, with Pete Bill. Book there. Uh, I, I, did, I did put the full poll up. If you have any uh, other comments, if you could, or we'll end that in a few seconds. Yes. Uh, so one question from my side uh, to both of you: uh, Tell us uh, that in which kind of organization agile HR will not work? Will not work. <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, so, you know, I maybe go back to that second question that's, that we asked earlier, that uh, if, if your organization does not have an openness to experimentation and a mind for inclusivity, those two elements of culture that are embedded in our six principles, and I think this is a, a difficult task, and I would recommend that you work on those elements before you engage in the agile process, because it's very important to have a cultural impetus behind this program. So if your organization seems very hierarchical in its structure and uh, has uh, leaders who are um, really aloof and, a, and away from curiosity and asking questions in your organization, then some preparation work certainly needs to be done before you start implementing Agile. On the other hand, if your organization is recognizing that we are in uh, interesting times, disruptive times, and we need to get faster, better solutions, and your leadership team has already recognized that the pathway to do that is to start to rethink the way that we're doing things, then you have a very good foundation for using Agile as a methodology to accelerate that process and make it work. So um, it's a very good question. And uh, we always, that's why we start with the, eval the readiness evaluation, because what we want to detect from that readiness evaluation is how ready is your culture, not just your organization in order for us to help you with developing the approach to agile methodology in HR leadership that might be needed in your organization. You, you like to touch upon, just a last point, you, do you like to touch upon how long this exercise can be if somebody really wanted to implement agile HR, how long that exercise can be, average, average timeline, cycle? Well, the, the, I mean, it, each organization is different. As I mentioned before, it's not a, it's, there's no end date for Agile, it's a way of working. So let's say you look at the meetings we talked about. We, we take you know two hour weekly meetings and nothing gets done and we create 15 minute sessions every day where we ask three questions. what did you do yesterday? What are you gonna to do today? And what problems did you have? And that's forever, really, you know, it's, well, the length of the project. So let's say you're putting in a compensation system we talked about, however long it takes to get that done you would follow the Agile methodology. And one would hope that once the compensation system is done, then you need a training program. Then you need a applicant tracking system. And so it seems to me that um, HR leaders, this is an ongoing way of working. Now you, you certainly can apply it to specific project, um, but we would encourage, you know, the worst thing you do is have a work on Agile with a project, complete it, put it out there and then fall back on the old ways because what's going to happen, people aren't going to use it. It's not going to be sustained um, and things like that. So um, just one comment, because I was a, Steve worked inside an organization. I typically was a one person on the outside. And so for the lone rangers out there, there are those of you that are perhaps frustrating your organizations that really want to make changes, but you can't get buy-in. I think this, this methodology is perfect for you. It, it, it allows you to 
get energy and passion. You know, the worst thing you can do is when you're trying to do something is you give, give up hope based on resistance, whereas this methodology, starting a small team, building some momentum is a great tool for you. So, you know, feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions around that. But, but I'm, you know, we're, we're excited. You know, maybe we're preaching the choir here, but we are very, we love evangelizing this stuff because we believe and we've seen it work. So that's, that's bring us to end of the session. And uh, thank you, Stefan and Van, joining all the way from USA. That's morning for them. It's uh, close to 10 o'clock, if I'm not wrong. And uh, we had a good number of people join in this session. So up to 150 we touch upon today. I mean, still there are 75 people out there. Yep. Yep. I, I like when you're one of the one of the statement, I was going through your post that customer service should not be one department, it should be actually entire company. Yep. So, so that, that relate to agile and agile HR thought process concept and you know, right. the approach. Yeah. yeah. Uh, say, any, well, that, that's very, that's yeah. very important question because uh, very often uh, the problems that we experience in HR are not exclusive to the HR function. So the idea that uh, people from other parts of the organization may hold a piece of the puzzle for solving an HR related issue, I think is a very important point that uh, while HR can be the initiator of this, the chances are pretty good that you're not to be pull other people in from around your organization who also have a piece of the solution that you need to bring. I certainly found that when we, we for instance, in HR, we had, a, well, there were legal implications, there were financial implications. So people from legal and from finance participated in helping to solve the HR initiatives that we have. It's part of the investigation process that takes place. Who do you want on the team? Well, we need a legal representation. We need an operations. We need a finance. We need a, a an expert in operations or whatever it is. So the composition of that first team is really important and it starts to radiate out the influence across the organization when you're using more than just HR people to solve these problems. You know, and I want to thank HR Shapers um, and our team for really uh, sponsoring this. You, you guys were incredible. I really appreciate that. And I hope this is the beginning of, you know, ongoing. Yeah. Again, we're agile, we're continuously, so we're not going to not connect anymore. We look forward to kind of expand this and working with you guys in the future. So sorry. Yeah, thanks to you. I'd like to have yeah. Thank you so much. It's our pleasure to have both of you on the VIP of HR Shepard and the Agile, Agile HR Consultant. I like to also, thanks Gautam and the, not the Vilasha, which I took the name. His name is Abhisheka. <laughs> so, thanks, both of you, <laughs> Abhisheka. Thanks, both of you, to bring us together. And this session is uh, getting Absolutely. over, which is, which is very valuable. And uh, we request people to get in touch with Van and Stephen uh, directly because their contact detail, email ID is already there in the mailer. You can take the photo of this screen and please do connect. Some of you are asking for an advanced module or basic module. Please do connect with Stephen and Van directly to know more about you know what they're doing, how they're doing. Are there any courses, module and all. Thank you so much. And uh, we look forward to see you in future again. Yeah. Thank Thanks you very everybody. much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.